Silver City deserves to be mentioned alongside iconic Old West towns like Dodge City, Deadwood, and Tombstone. In fact, Silver I've City predates shot. all of these, having been established earlier in 1870. A thorough examination of historical records and comparative analysis could potentially reveal that Silver City was not only the earliest of these quintessential frontier settlements, but also the most rugged and lawless. <laughs> Hello, cutie pie. How much does it cost? How much do you have, my fair young lad? Welcome to part two, The Outlaw Emerges. Part one of The Outlaw Emerges concludes with Catherine preparing for the upcoming family day. William, tomorrow we all need to find work. I want you to check the silver mines and apply for the supervisor position since you have the experience. Henry, you and Joseph will accompany me as I make rounds throughout the camp. Once we settle in at the Keystone Hotel, we'll bake some pies today. The following day in Silver City. Hello, sir. I'm Catherine Antrim. Can I offer you some fresh baked pastries hot off the stove a few minutes ago? Hi, Catherine. I'm Richard. Richard Knight, the local butcher. Give me four and also two for your boys. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Catherine spent the rest of her day promoting her baked goods, handing out business cards for her laundry services, and searching for a permanent residence. Antrim secured employment at the legal tender mine, but his pay was less than $3.50. Relocating often requires one to demonstrate their worth, yet earning a lower wage is preferable to being unemployed. According to the 1873 census, the local population consisted of 700 Hispanic residents and 350 non-Hispanic white residents. Hispanics would be paid $1 a day. If you're a foreman or manager of a mine, it makes sense to reserve higher wages for individuals with specialized skills. After all, running a mine is a business. Antrim, get back to work. The Antrim settled in a log cabin at the upper end of the big ditch in Silver City, specifically at the intersection of Main Street and East Broadway. This location provided easy access to a stream bed that ran alongside the cabin, making it an ideal water source for laundry purposes. Good evening, Mrs. Antrim. I have three messages for you. Thank you, Mr. Bonner. I will read them in the room. Hello, anyone here? Antrim, what are you doing home at this hour? And where are the boys? There was a big explosion today at the legal tender mine. I couldn't breathe and had to leave early. The boys are riding their horses and target practicing again. <laughs> I've received several laundry bids, including one for the Star Hotel that Mr. Thompson operates, which has 10 rooms. If I secure this contract, it will cover our monthly expenses comfortably and provide some extra. To fulfill this contract, I will need to produce a significant amount of soap. If anyone has any information about W.A. Thompson, please leave a comment below. I have searched Ancestry.com, old newspaper archives, and the internet, but have not found anything. Catherine's mind turned to the essential task of making soap. The process, while labor-intensive, was one she knew well. She would need two primary ingredients, lye and animal fat. With a determined nod, Catherine called out to her sons. Boys, I need you to gather some ashes and straw. Go check with the neighbors and merchants in town. Take six burlap sacks in the shed and get them filled. Lye is made by pouring water over ashes and letting it drip into a container. When the lye became deep red in color and when the liquid would float an egg or potato half above the surface of the mixture, it was ready. Fortunately, Richard Knight's butcher shop was directly across the street from Catherine's residence. From Ancestry.com, I found this. Uncle Dick opened a butcher shop at what is now the corner of Hudson and Broadway Street. Hi, Catherine. How can I help you today? I'm reaching out to see if I could acquire around 15 pounds of fat. I'm open to purchasing or offering a week's worth of laundry services in exchange. Absolutely, Catherine. We can work out something. I'll send one of my helpers over to your cabin with the 15 pounds of fat in the next hour. Good day. The boys return with ample straw and ash. Boil the lye and fat together and heat up in slow stir for an hour. 
Pour into a mold or container for 24 hours. That's it. Creating enough soap for your family typically requires about one day. In contrast, producing a sufficient quantity for a laundry service may take approximately one to two weeks. The current map of businesses in Silver City is still being developed. Notably, the Star Hotel and Knight's Butcher Shop are situated in close proximity to Antrim's cabin. 10 Pins McGarry and Dyer on Main Street. Gentlemen will find good alleys and new walls and pins and a boy to set pins that can fix them to suit without retouching. Come in and enjoy the sport, warranted to benefit the invalid as well as strengthen the muscles of Ye Hardy Minor. In addition, we have a first-class bar that is always supplied with the best of brandies, whiskeys, wines, and cigars. And over the whole institution presides as a mixist, one who knows how to do it. Come in, boys. You can get anything from first principles to stone fenny. Bowling started to become a gambling game. And as a result, Connecticut banned nine pin bowling in 1841 in order to try and prevent gambling. This couldn't stop people from playing the game and 10 pin bowling was created to bypass the law. William McGarry's 1880 census shows his occupation as a cabinet maker. Perfect job skill to make a wooden lane used for bowling. Joseph Dyer, no information is found. Did Billy McCarty ever go bowling? If you enjoyed this video and would like to learn more about Billy the Kid in Silver City, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel. And thanks for watching. Hi, I'm Billy, Billy the Kid. If you ever wanted to know about the history of White Oaks, New Mexico, I've got you covered. The site is whiteoaksnewmexicogoldrush.com.